Hello everyone! In this presentation, we will talk about how grade groups can be used for cryptography. My name is Stephanie, and I will start by giving an introduction to grade groups. Then Peter will show you some cryptographical schemes based on these grade groups. And since all of these schemes are also based on the conjugacy problem and the conjugate research problem, Jiayi will then talk about some solutions to these problems because they can be used to attack our schemes. And finally, Helena will discuss how the schemes can be improved so they become safer. Let's start with the introduction to braid groups. You will see that braid groups are really intuitive and that they are literally just groups of braids, but of course we have to make this specific. First, I will show you the setting that we will be working in to define a geometric braid on n strings. We will work in the three-dimensional Euclidean space, R3. In this space, we have a coordinate system, x, y, z, with the z-axis pointing downwards. Now we choose two parallel horizontal planes, called the upper plane and the lower plane. And then we choose n points on a line in the upper plane, and project them orthogonally onto the lower plane. And eventually, the strings of the braid will connect these points to each other. But before we move on to that, I just want to clarify that we obviously have some freedom in how we choose these planes and these points, but once we have chosen them, they stay fixed. And you will see from the theory that follows that indeed it doesn't really matter how they are chosen specifically. So in the setting that I just showed you, we define a geometric braid on n strings, also called an n braid, as a system of n arcs in R3, such that each arc AI connects the point PI on the upper plane to a point P prime tau of I on the lower plane, such that three properties hold. First of all, this map tau over here has to be a permutation. This means that the points on the upper plane are all connected to different points on the lower plane, and we call tau the permutation of the braid. The second property is that each arc should intersect every horizontal plane between the upper and the lower plane exactly once. And finally, the arcs are not allowed to intersect each other. We will call the arc AI the i-th string of the braid. So for example, this is a braid on four strings. The permutation of this braid is shown on the side. The first point on the upper plane is connected to the fourth point on the lower plane. The second point on the upper plane is connected to the first point on the lower plane, and so on. To define the braid group, we won't just be working with a set of geometric braids on end strings. Instead, we will be working with equivalence classes of these geometric braids. For example, take a look at the two braids on the side. We can obtain the braid on the right from the braid on the left by stretching out the third string. And it is intuitively clear that stretching strings doesn't really fundamentally change a braid. With this in mind, we can take a look at the definition of equivalence braids. In this definition, we consider the strings of a braid as paths in R3. And we say that two n braids with the same permutation tau are equivalent if for every i there exists a path homotopy between the i strings of both braids, such that during these homotopies, the strings always form an n braid with permutation tau. So basically, what this definition says is that two braids with the same permutation are equivalent if you can obtain one from the other by stretching the strings in such a way that the endpoints stay fixed. So now we define BN as the set of equivalence classes of geometric braids on N strings, and we impose a group structure on it by defining a product between two geometric braids on N strings. The product works as follows. Given two N braids, A1 and A2, we attach A2 below A1 by letting the upper plane of A2 coincide with the lower plane of A1 making sure that the points pi are connected to, to the points pi prime. The result is shown in the middle. Next, we remove the plane along which a1 and a2 are attached to each other, and we squeeze the arcs vertically such that they fit between the original upper and lower plane again. The final result is what we call the product of a1 with a2. 
It's not difficult to see that this product is well defined and associative. The neutral element for this product is of course just the brief that consists of straight lines as shown in this figure. We call this the trivial end braid. The inverse of a braid is its mirror image with respect to the lower plane. This is illustrated here. So um, this braid is just a mirror image with respect to the lower plane of this braid. And then you can see that if we take the product, it is equivalent to the trivial braid. Now we will take a look at a presentation for the braid group. The generators will be so-called elementary braids. If i lies between 1 and n-1, then the i-th elementary braid, denoted by sigma i, is just the n braid in which the i-th string crosses over the next string, and all other strings are straight lines. In the inverse of sigma i, the i-th string crosses under the next string. It's obvious that each braid can be written as a product of these elementary braids, because by looking at uh, equivalent braids if necessary, you can always make sure that each crossing of two strings occurs on a different level. To give a presentation of the braid group, we also need a set of relations. The first relation is that sigma i times sigma j is equal to sigma j times sigma i if the absolute value of i minus j is strictly greater than 1. This is very easy to see on the figure. The second relation is this one. It's a bit more difficult to see immediately, but you can go from the braid on the left to the braid on the right by moving the first string downwards, the second string to the right, and the third string upwards. And in fact, these are the only two relations that we need to define Bn. This is summarized in this theorem. In order to use braids for cryptography, we need to decide how we are going to represent them. One option is to choose one distinguished braid word in each equivalence class. We will call this the normal form. So how is this defined? First, we define Vn plus as a set of all positive braids. These are braids that can be written as a product of only the elementary braids without their inverses. Then we define these braids delta m effectively. And now it can be shown that each braid in the n can be written as a product of a power of delta n and a positive braid. This decomposition is unique if we require k to be maximal. Now we want to decompose this positive braid b as well, and we will do this by using simple braids. A positive n braid c is called simple if there exists another positive n braid d such that the product of c and d is equal to delta n. Now we call a sequence of this form where k is an integer and b1 up to br are simple braids distinct from 1 and delta n, a normal sequence if for each i the braid bi is the maximal simple left divisor of this product shown here. And there is a theorem that says that every n braid admits a unique decomposition of this form such that the corresponding sequence is normal. We call this sequence the normal form of the braid and we call r the complexity of the braid. We also say that k is the infimum of the braid and that k plus r is the supremum. A big advantage of using normal braid words to represent a braid is that checking whether two braids are equivalent becomes trivial. On the other hand, it makes multiplication more difficult, because when multiplying two braids, the normal form of the product has to be calculated, and the time cost of putting a braid word in its normal form is quadratic in the length of the braid word. Another option is to just use arbitrary braid words. Now, multiplication becomes trivial, but it becomes more difficult to check whether two braid words are equivalent to each other. Actually, the algorithm to do this is more efficient than the algorithm to calculate the normal form of a braid word, so it might seem like this option is better than working with the normal form. However, when drawing random braids, which is something we do a lot in cryptography, the average complexity of a braid word is not proportional to its length. 
So if you choose a random braid word with a certain length, then you can't be sure what the complexity of the normal form of this braid is going to be. And we want to have control over this complexity to be safe for attacks. So that's why the previous option is actually better. That was everything I wanted to tell you about braid groups. Now Peter will show you some cryptographical schemes. Hello everyone, I'm Peter and I'm going to be talking about some of the applications of braid groups in cryptography. So the first thing I'm just going to mention very quickly, a one-way function, um, it's a very important cryptographic notion. I'm not going to give you the technical details, but broadly speaking, it's an invertible function, algorithmically simple to compute, but complex to invert. Um, I've mentioned that these are potentially one-way problems. The existence of one-way functions are not actually known because um, if you were to show that something was a one-way function, that would also uh, show that p is not equal to np, which is a very famous computer science conjecture. So we don't actually know if any of them exist, but these are known to be fairly uh, algorithmically complex to um, invert, at least the algorithms we have. So the first such problem is called the root existence problem. So if you have some element of g, b, does there exist an element c such that c to the e equals b for um, uh, exponent e? Uh, the related problem is the root extraction problem, which is actually finding the C. So this is just showing that there is one. This is finding the actual element itself. Um, Helena will talk about this a little bit later. The minimal length problem, we won't go into too much detail here, but if you have a distinguished set of generators for a group G and a word W, what's the shortest word which is equivalent um, to your original word? So what's the shortest way you can write an element? And the conjugated search problem is going to be the focus of this part of the presentation. So the conjugated search problem goes like this. If you have an element g in g and an element g dashed in g, and you know that the two are conjugates, can you find the s that actually makes them conjugate? And there are several cryptographic schemes based on this problem, right? based on the difficulty of this problem. Um, we know that this problem is solvable in braid groups, but the best known algorithms may not have polynomial time solutions, and Jai Yi will talk about that a bit later. So the anshul anshul goldfeld scheme works like this. It's a key exchange scheme. So key exchange schemes are basically, you have an unsecured communication channel between two people and they want to be able to compute some shared piece of private data. So it's not known to anyone who might have, uh, who might be eavesdropping on their communication channel. So everything that is in blue is public data and the stuff that's in red is um, private data. And the goal is to get some piece of private data that is known by both parties. So the public keys that Alice and Bob generate in this case are subgroups uh, of G, um, and they have some, some set of generators P1 through PL and Q1 through QM. Um, Alice and Bob choose um, elements of their subgroups as private keys. And then with those uh, private keys, they take each of the generators of the other person's subgroup and they calculate the conjugate of each of those generators by their own element. Why do they do that? Well, you'll see in a second. Uh, then they transmit them, of course. Um, because the conjugate of products is the product of conjugates, with the conjugate elements that they have sent across to each other, Bob and Alice can compute any word, any element in their subgroup conjugated with the other's private key using a, you know, this kind of relation here. Um, this allows them to compute the shared key that they wanted, which in this case is u to the minus one, v to the minus one, u, v. So Bob computes it, u to the minus one, v, u, takes the inverse and appends his private key. And Alice com uh, computes v to the minus one, u, v, and prepends the inverse of her private key. So someone was listening, uh, Eve was listening, what does she know? Well, she knows all the publicly transmitted data, which is the two subgroups and the conjugates generators, and also the original generators. So she knows that qi dashed as well, she knows how the scheme works, so she knows qi dashed is u to the minus one qi u, and pj dashed is v to the minus one pj v. So she has some set of simultaneous equations for u and v. So if she can solve that set of simultaneous equations, she can find u and v and calculate the private key. So the security rests on the difficulty of this multiple conjugator search problem. Um, just as a note, of course, if you can just solve this, that's the conjugator search problem that I mentioned earlier. So it also rests on the difficulty of the conjugator search problem. 
course, the multiple conjugated search problem should be easier because you have more information. So in order to um, be secure versus the algorithms that we know currently exist, the security recommendations are that you work in at least B80, so the braid group with 80 strands, with a length of U and V of being at least 20 and the length of each of your generators being between 5 and 10, the word length. So Diffie-Hellman-like scheme is another key exchange scheme. So again, G is a group, you're trying to communicate securely. Alice and Bob broadcast their public keys, which is some element G, and then two subgroups, SA and SB of G, with the following property, that any element in the two subgroups commute, uh, commutes with the other subgroup. Um, so they don't have to be commutative interiorly, but they have to be commutative with the other subgroup that's been chosen. Braid groups are good for this because braid groups contain pretty large um, subgroups that commute with each other um, because the non-commutative part of braid groups are the bits in the adjacent strands but if you have two parts that are a little bit far, further apart they can commute with each other um, so they choose their private keys from their subgroups and then they compute the conjugate of G the distinguished element with their private key and then they transmit that because the two things commute they can then com uh, they can then compute the shared key, which is v to the minus one g uh, v or uh, conjugated with u. And of course, you can flip these round and you'll get the one that Bob com commutes. Um, you can flip them around because u to the minus one and v to the minus one are commuting and v to and u are commuting. So what's the security of this key? How, how, uh, how secure is it? Well, we have the, the publicly transmitted data, which is s a b g g dash g double dash. Um, and she knows that u to the minus one g u equals g dash. She knows how the scheme works again. So you actually have again two equations for u and v. Um, if you can solve those equations, then you can uh, find u and v, and you can um, crack the security of this. You can crack the private key. You can find the private key. This problem is called the Diffie-Hellman-like conjugator search problem. Uh, again. Given the algorithms we know for the conjugator search problem, it's recommended to work at least B80, and here the sequences should be at least length 12. Now there is actually uh, a little nuance here, which is that you can potentially calculate the shared key um, in a simpler way. So if you have you know, some elements A1, A2, such that a1 g a2 is actually equal to g dashed and b1 g b2 is equal to g double dashed then when you calculate this this thing here you'll find that you've actually calculated the key itself so instead of trying to find the the conjugate pairs u1 u and v minus 1 v you can just find a1 a2 b1 b2 this may be simpler than the conjugator search problem and it's called the decomposition problem now you've got a shared key, you may also want to send messages. In order to send messages, you have to be able to encipher and decipher your messages. So let's say that uh, you have a message M. We can think of this as some string of zeros and ones. Um, and we have, we need, what we need is a collision-free one-way hash function from G to zero, one to the N. Um, if K is the shared key that you have, you can use the exclusive or uh, operation on 0, 1 to the n. Basically, um, 0 and 0 become 0, 1 and 1 become 0, 0 and 1 becomes 1. And that's very nice because all you then need to do to decrypt is to just add the same thing again. Um, so since both of them know the private key, both of them can compute the hash of the private key, they can very easily encrypt and decrypt messages. The final thing that you might want to do is to sign a message. So basically, if um, someone has broadcast some data, uh, sorry, someone is trying to send a message and you want to be certain that the person sending the message is really the person who they claim to be, you might want to use a signature scheme. So the signature scheme in this case is that Alice has broadcast some private key P and P dash, which you know is from Alice, so that has to have happened beforehand. Um, and then she has a private key, which is S. The public keys that she's computed are such that P dashed is equal to S to the minus one P S. So it's the conjugate of P by S. So now if we have some message M um, and H is a collision 
free one-way hash function from 0, 1 to the n to g, so the other way around this time. Um, if q, which we call this the, if q is the, the result of the, the hashing function on, on our message m, then the signature it, that Alice generates is uh, basically um, taking the conjugate of q by her private key s. Now, if she does this, if this is what has happened, then q and q dash will be conjugate because we see this here, and pq and pq dash will be conjugate because we'll while well, p dash q dash will be s to the minus one p s s to the minus one, so that will cancel. We'll get pq in the middle. We'll get s on the end. So you'll get that these both of these are conjugate pairs. Obviously, in order to actually use this kind of scheme, we have to be able to tell whether two elements are actually conjugate. Um, and this is called the conjugacy problem, and Jai will again talk about this a little bit later. Um, so let's say Eve wants to falsely sign the message M. Well, uh, again, we have to define Q as equal to H of M. In order to fool Bob, she needs to find some element Q dashed such that the pairs Q and Q dashed and PQ and P dash Q dash are conjugates, because then he's checking that they are conjugates. He will be fooled and um, he will think that it's Alice who sent the message. So the security of the scheme is therefore dependent on the difficulty of this problem, which is called the matching conjugate search problem. All right, and I will pass you over to Jai. So thanks, Peter, for leading us into the bread-based schemes. As he describes, the signature scheme can work actually relies on the fact that the conjugacy problem is easy. So in this part, we are going to discuss different algorithms towards the conjugacy problem. The first algorithm starts with the definition of supersummit set. The supersummit set of a braid B is a set of all conjugates of B with the minimal possible complexity. It's finite and it's algorithmically computable. Moreover, by construction, two braids B and B prime are conjugate if and only if their supersummit set are the same. In practice, it suffices to check whether these sets intersect or not. Here is how we compute the supersummit set of B. Firstly, we check if B has a minimal complexity. If B has some high complexity as indicated in this graph, B does not reside in its supersummit set. Then we do cycling or decycling for at most polynomial times, and we are guaranteed to find a conjugate B with strictly lower complexity. In the graph, all these white circles represent the conjugates of B, and this is one with strictly lower complexity. By repeating the operation, we slowly slide down until B star, which lies in the supersummit set of B. Then starting from this single representative, we do simple conjugation to get the full supersummit set of B. Now we have all the preparations and a complete procedure to solve the conjugacy problem is as follows. With cycling or decycling, we find a conjugate B star of B lying in its supersummit set. Do similar operations to find a conjugate B prime star of B prime of minimal complexity. If the complexity of B star is different from B prime star, then B and B prime are not conjugate. At this step, we can also test other invariants like the maximum of, of infimum or the minimum of supremum. If we can't distinguish them from these invariants, then we'll have to determine the full supersummit set of B by simple conjugations. B and B prime are conjugate if and only if B prime star lies in the supersummit set of B. It seems that we also solve the conjugator search problem if we keep track. Namely, if B and B prime are conjugate, we can find the conjugator. 
Um, but by no means can we solve it easily because our crypto system actually relies on the fact that the conjugator search problem is difficult. Indeed, in the worst case, both the time and the memory requirements of this algorithm are proportional to the cardinality of the supersummit set of B. The best proven bound for this cardinality is exponential in both spread index and complexity. Exponential indicates difficult. Scientists are working hard to improve this method. The key problem here is the cardinality of supersummit set is exponentially big, just too big. What if we consider a smaller subset? This leads us into the definition of ultrasummit set. We observe that starting with any elements in the supersummit set, iterated cycling becomes eventually periodic. So we define the ultrasummit set as follows. It's uh, the ultrasummit set of a braid B is a union of cyclic parts of the orbits in the supersummit set. In this graph, the elements of ultrasummit set are emphasized with black color. So we can solve the conjugacy problem similarly by checking if the ultrasummit set of B and B prime coincide. USS as a subset of SSS has much lower size. For some cases, its size can be even linear with respect to complexity. But in general, nothing proved so far. The average complexity might turn out to be polynomial. Now we move on to another method to solve the conjugacy problem, namely the one with Burrell representation and Alexander polynomial. Firstly, we recall a representation of group G is a homomorphism from G to a matrix group over some ring. The Burrell representation is the best known representation of a braid group BM. It maps generator sigma i into a matrix as such. Then any braid element can be written with generators and their inverses. Hence, in general, the Burrell representation is an n-1 square matrix over the Laurent polynomial ring. Moreover, the Alexander polynomial of a braid B is obtained by the determinant of square matrix phi B minus I, and we denote this Alexander polynomial by PBT. Alexander polynomial is a class function. It takes a constant value on a given conjugacy class. Um, it's not a too surprising result because we all know the characteristic polynomial is a class function. And the Alexander polynomial is actually the evaluation of characteristic polynomial at lambda equals to one. So a good question to ask at this point is, uh, how powerful Alexander polynomial as an invariant is, to what extent can it distinguish between uh, conjugates and non-conjugates? Given two m brace b and b prime, if they have the same Alexander polynomial, then b prime is conjugate to b up to only one exception. Namely, they have the same infimum, same supremum, and B prime is conjugate to the reverse of B. In the signature scheme, we choose B prime either to be a conjugate of B or randomly, so the exception never happens, and Alexander polynomial is a powerful enough test. We perform the Alexander polynomial test towards the null hypothesis B prime is conjugate to B with error bound chi as follows. For the statisticians in the audience, the error bound chi here refers to the type 2 error. We first calculate the Alexander polynomial of B and B prime. Then select R and prime P such that this fraction is bounded by chi. 
Then we compare the evaluations of two polynomials at randomly chosen r values of t in a finite field z mod p. If they coincide at t1 up to tr, then we do not reject the null hypothesis. Because pbt minus pb prime t is a polynomial of order at most ln times n minus 1 over 2. So the probability that the Alexander polynomial are different but still pass the test is bounded by this fraction, hence bounded by chi as we desire. The complexity of Alexander polynomial test is not exponential, it's of polynomial order. So, the, uh, so this algorithm is suitable, to, uh, is suitable to decide the conjugacy problem. And this algorithm does not lead to solutions of the conjugator search problem. This guarantees the gap of the difficulty of the two problems, thereby the feasibility of the signature scheme in braid-based cryptography. Next, Helena will explain some possible improvements towards our braid-based schemes. For example, what are the possible attacks and how we defined against these attacks. Thank you. Thanks, Shai, to tell a bit more about the attacks. We've just seen some attacks on a braid-based cryptography, but this will not lead to, to give up some applications of braids to cryptography, since the attacks not always work. Still, some research can be done to improve the security of those cryptographic schemes. This research will focus on several aspects of cryptography, for example, on key generation, alternatives for the conjugated search problem, and so on, or determine whether the size of the upper summit set is polynomial or not. This will tell a lot about the effectiveness of the previous described attacks. In this last part of the presentation, we will go deeper on to key generation and a recent alternative for the conjugator search problem. But First, a side note to show that random key generation isn't secure at all. Assume we have two random braids S and P, and we conjugate P by S, then it's likely that a large prefix of S is directly readable in the normal form of SPS to the power of minus 1. In a table, the average number of initial simple factors of S, which remains directly readable, are given. And notice also that how larger N is, or more likely it is that a large prefix of S is directly readable. For length-based attacks, we can encounter the effectiveness of the attack by choosing an appropriate key generation. But first we'll have a look at an important result about the complexity of the product of two braids. This theorem tells uh, that the given inequality is actually an optimal inequality. In our case, this means that the less inequality is actually an equality with probability virtually 1, and when b1 is equal to the inverse of b2, then their product is 1, thus their complexity is 0. As a consequence, the following equation holds with high probability. So we can conclude that it's likely that the complexity of the conjugacy of b of the braid p is larger than the complexity of the braid p itself. To understand better the solution to defeat most length-based attacks, we will explain what the basic idea is of a length-based attack. A length-based attack is actually a probabilistic approach to attack a braid scheme instead of giving an exact solution to the conjugator search problem. So, assume we want to know the conjugator of a pair B P accent. It is statistically almost sure that B lies in its own supersummit set. When we conjugate this braid P, then it's likely with the previous remark in mind that the complexity of B accent is larger than the complexity of B. So we obtain B accent by conjugating P by the successive letters of S. So we start with B accent to conjugacy of B and lower its complexity till B accent star has minimal complexity. The successive uh, the sending steps don't need to coincide with the sending steps leading from B to B accent. We could land on a braid in the supersummit set of B, 
which lies often at a distance of at most one simple conjugacy. If this is the case, then we can easily retrieve uh, the conjugator we are looking for. We can defeat a length-based attack by requiring that the public key pair BPXN uh, have the same complexity, and we can check that the distance between B and BXN is more than one simple conjugacy. This could be done by choosing B and BXN such that they are conjugates of a common third braid. For the multiple conjugator search problem and the Diffie-Hellman-like conjugacy problem, it seems difficult to construct such pairs. Right now, the most of the proposed cryptographical schemes so far relies on the conjugator problem, search problem only. But recently, in November 2019, an article was published with a proposed scheme which didn't rely only on the conjugator search problem, but also on the exchange decomposition problem. The hardness of the problem relies on the fact that it can be difficult given two positive braids U and V, which are both a product of S and T, to determine the positive braids S and T. A theorem related to the hardness of the problem is a theorem which states that the hardness of finding braids S and T, knowing only U and V, is equivalent to the hardness of finding S when given the braids X and Y. Notice that in a definition, we specify that S and T should be positive braids and in a theorem they can be non-positive as well. In a theorem, we take also the inverse of S of the braids, but there is no inverse of any element in the same group of the positive braids. So we can conclude that the exchange decomposition problem is at least as hard as a conjugate problem. Therefore, based on this new computing problem, we can put forward a better cryptographic algorithm in the same group of the positive braids. As told in a previous slide, an advantage of this new problem is that it is at least as hard as a conjugate search problem. A second one is, since we work with braids for the exchange decomposition problem, which are elements in a same group of the positive braids, attacks from the past based on the group properties of the answering braids, group wouldn't work here on the same group. An advantage which is applicable for all schemes proposed in this presentation is the fact that these schemes and other schemes relying on braids group are quantum proof. This means that those schemes are probably secure against an attack by a quantum computer. The next group will tell more about quantum cryptography. A probably negative remark is that this scheme based on exchange decomposition problem is brand new and maybe there are some undiscovered security issues. The overall conclusion of this presentation is that braid groups have a lot of advantages due to their intuitive and appealing character. Even the possibilities to work with braid groups in cryptography are not all explored yet. Like the safety of the alternative of the conjugated search problem, the exchange decomposition problem we talked about. We've also seen that there exist attacks against the proposed schemes, but those attacks don't condemn the subjects of braid groups in cryptography, since there is nothing proved about the size of the upper summit sets, which tells more about the effectiveness of the attack. Also, more investigation on the key generation can lead to a more crypt uh, secure cryptographic scheme. So, thanks for listening to our presentation. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them.